Troy, where we talk a big game, but have even bigger opinions. Good evening. I'm Judo Kanyas. And I'm Jonathan Martin. And you already know it is a special day today. You know why that is, Jude? Because why? it's the NBA day and all 30 teams are playing. We're going to jump straight into it. We've got a little bit of our predictions from last week's show. We were talking about earlier about the teams that could fall off. And I think the Pacers were a very, very easy target. I believe that the Pacers are going to fall all the way to the eight. I think mm. Miami's going to hold firm. Because you look at the Pacers schedule. They have OKC. They could struggle. They have yeah. Miami. Yeah, both teams have, have Oklahoma Raptors, City. They have the Raptors, the Cavs, and the Hawks. I mean, I think that's, playing the Cavs at That's home. probably three. Lo- that's three losses. Yeah. That's two yeah. and three. Yeah. That's why and I have so- them. I have the Lakers going in you the Lakers. escaping the play-in. I do, too. I do. <laughs> well, those are wise words from, from our own Dr. Nikki. And luckily, she's here in studio to really break down. Because in the past week, it's been crazy, right? We, yep. We've seen a lot of games that should have been won, lost. You know, mm-hmm. that was the big thing. We've seen big matchups. Denver Nuggets, Minnesota Timberwolves just faced off a few days ago. Dr. Nikki, what do you have us f- for us on these NBA playoffs? Yeah, thanks, guys. I'm uh, here on live TV to eat humble pie because uh, <laughs> the Lakers did not make the playoffs and avoid the play-in. They're locked into the play-in right now with the Warriors in the West. Uh, Hawks are locked in the play-in in the East. But, you know, NBA season ends on Sunday. We got a ton of stuff going on in the meantime. Our big guys at the top are almost certainly locked in. The Celtics, certainly Nuggets. The Celtics, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, certainly the Celtics are locked in. But, I mean, a lot of these guys could move in the next few days. We got some good matchups going on. So these are my predictions for the seedings for the NBA playoffs this year in the East and the West. Of course, we've got why the Celtics. Why don't you uh, run us through the East oh, real quick and, and just give us who, who's Let there. me run you all through the East. I got that. We got the Celtics over here, by and large, the number one seed. In the East, we got the Bucks, who are looking really competitive lately. The Knicks, who have held firm, which we did actually get right in our predictions last week. The Knicks did hold firm. Yep. Uh, Cavs, we got next. Cavs are one of those teams in like the four to eight seed, all sort of duking it out for playoff positioning right now. But the Cavs have a really, really interesting matchup later today that could determine their playoff position. Then I have the 76ers. No bias here. No, <laughs> no, nothing. The 76ers just got Joel Embiid back. They look really good since his return. Maxie's making an MIP case. I got them at five. I got the Orlando Magic sliding down to six after a loss to the 76ers this evening, hopefully. And uh, Pacers at seven. And unfortunately for Ethan, the Heat did not hold strong. They are down at eight for me and my NBA playoffs predictions for the East. So the East is... You know, it's the East and the West share some similarities. It's really tightening in the West as well. Can you speak to that, Dr. Nicky? Oh, both are competitive. Both are competitive. I mean, obviously, the West uh, is a better conference in terms of wins, but they're both competitive right now. Nuggets look really good, but the T-Wolves are breathing down their neck. You know, the T-Wolves have been looking good all season. A couple people back from injury. Thunder look really good. Clippers at the four is tough. They got the Mavs coming up behind them, a game behind. Might be looking tough. Either way, this oh, is going to be a one bit, tough Nicky. first round. Doesn't scare round. me one You don't think bit. so? I'm trying Not to scare you. Bit. Not one no? bit. No? Okay, I okay. feel about my Clippers the same way you feel about your Sixers. Okay. And, and what's that? What's that? Oh, no, Clippers like, are winning the Natty. They say oh, that. Clippers are winning the Natty. natty. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they God, say so we had to change here. up the championship <laughs> names so they could win Clippers. Clippers will be all right against the Mavs. What I have a big problem with, though, in your East, look, Dr. Nicky. Yeah. I love you, Dr. Nikki, but you're delusional <laughs> if you think that the Pacers are getting passed up by the 76ers. I, mean, I, I can't with the Sixers uh, hate. First, it was last week, and you guys still haven't learned. I, I don't get it. The Sixers right now are a full game ahead, or the Pacers are a full game ahead of the 76ers, uh, and the Pacers also have the tiebreaker because they went 2-1 and one against the Sixers. True. The Pacers have to lose out, and the Sixers have to win out for the Absolutely. Sixers to pass up. The Pacers have the Hawks. Easy dub. Easy Set dub. in stone. Set in stone. Okay. But they play the Cavaliers today. So. They do play the Cavs today. Some interesting, interesting action Cavs today. Cavs will be tough. Cavs will be tough. Cavs will be but tough. But I will say the Sixers also have to play the Magic. That might be a loss. And I will say, that Magic game tonight, I've got my eyes all over. Oh, because trenches. The, the 76ers have already won both matchups against the, against this Magic yep. team. And although one of them was with Embiid, one of them was without. And obviously Embiid's back this game. I think this this Magic team, they know that they're fighting for a playoff spot in the first mm. time for a while. Paolo Banquero is really taking over as that playmaker role. I wouldn't be surprised if the, if the Magic play spoiler tonight against mm. the 76ers. So, I just see, I, I don't know, I think experience beats youth in this situation. The Magic as a core together just haven't had that sort of pressure to push them there. We'll see how it goes. I'll be tuned in. <laughs> yeah, you will be tuned in because there are a couple of marquee matchups that are happening tonight. Dr. Nikki, you know about this. 
Give us the scoop. Oh, absolutely. So we've got our must-see marquee matchups. If you don't watch any games, you might as well watch these five. The first one, again, no bias. We've got the 76ers and the Magic coming on. Mm. 4 p.m. PST. And like we said, that's going to be a dogfight. Look at that. Oh, look at that action. Look at Paulo already cooking. Look at the Magic Carol team already cooking crazy. against the Sixers. Looks ridiculous. Wouldn't be surprised oh, if they do it again. Put it back. Put it back. <laughs> But Man. then in this matchup, you know, the Sixers ended up coming back behind the crazy performance from Maxi. Look at this. Look at this. Ah, even Tobias could give it to you. Ah, <laughs> if Tobias is giving it to you, you might not have a chance. Look at that beautiful finish up around the rim. Like I said, Maxi's making a great case for MIP. He's a front runner right now. Sixers looking really good ahead of this matchup tonight. That's who I got to take. 4 p.m. PST. I'm looking forward to it. Get him, Max. And the next one we got, Cavs Pacers. We talked about a little bit. This is going to be a tough one. This is a little bit of a season split. Uh, Cavs have won one. Pacers have won two. Uh, Halley actually plays a little bit, you know, tough against these guys. He's got a couple weak double-doubles, I'll say. But both teams really play better when they share the ball. Like, look at this. It's going to be a big battle of the bigs inside. Look at that. Ah. I was going to say, you have, you know, some, some big height in there, the Mobley boys. Yeah, I think then, the Allen Siakam yeah. thing is going to be pretty crazy. Look yeah. at this. Look at that. Ah. Give me that. Give me that right back. <laughs> All right. That's our boy. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think for the Pacers, Cavs, the biggest thing you're going to need is your playmakers to show up, right? Donovan oh, absolutely. Mitchell and Darius Garland, as good as they've been, they've, they've got to show up a little bit more. And last year, yeah. you know, they said the lights were too bright for them. You know, they said the lights were too bright for them, which is probably one of the craziest quotes to say after a postseason. One of the most yeah. iconic quotes. It, but, but, but I love know, using it. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a great yeah. quote. It's great. But at least they were, they were self-conscious about it. And I, and I think for them to have any sort of turnaround this year, I know their coach, his job's are on the line. J.D. Biggerstaff, his, his job's kind of on the line oh, with yeah. this postseason and what they're going to be able to do. So Donovan Mitchell, you know, and Darius Garland are going to have to show up. I, I, I yeah. think to win this game right here, this is crucial. Because right now you have them right now at the fifth, fourth spot. Right there. So they'll be matching up against the and 76ers. They need to win out in order to get there. And It'll they need the to win out. And, and, and that's going to be a tough matchup against the, the 76ers. Maker. You know, I mean, Joel Embiid's going to be tough to stop, but we know classic 76ers talk in the postseason. Uh, <laughs> second round exit. Second round exit. Not a first round. Not well, this What year. else do we got on the docket for these oh, marquee yeah. matchups today? I mean, if we stay in the East, another really exciting matchup is Heat and Raptors tonight. Uh, Heat are struggling a little bit in the past few games. Ah, oh, look at that. Give me that. Ah. <laughs> Last few games, uh, they met on January 17th last. The Raptors won out 121-97 with 28 from Gary Trent Jr., 26 from R.J. Barrett, 20 from Scotty Barnes. Role players are the key for Miami, mm. so we got to see how this plays out. In the win against, uh, against the Raptors on December 6th, they got 21 points from Duncan Robinson, 24 and 12 from Caleb Martin. So, so Duncan has been playing much better this season, opening yeah. up his creativity. I was gonna say this is one of those matchups. It's just like a lot of like obviously there's 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 star players on both teams. You know you have mm -hmm. R.J. Barrett, you have Tyler Hero, Bam Adebayo, but Jimmy buckets, Jimmy buckets as well. <laughs> I didn't mean to forget third him. string. My point is these are guys like yeah they're good, but I feel like they're just they're harder hard nosed basketball players more. The Heat mm -hmm. culture obviously exists. Yep. We know about that. I've got the heat. I think I, I've show got up. the heat too, and, yeah. I, and I think the yep. thing that we've now been able to learn from the Miami don't Heat don't count is, them out. Don't yeah. count don't them count out. out. Right? Don't, don't count, count them out. out. The unfortunate it, thing is, it's too little, too late for the but playoffs. But is it situation. too little, too late? I mean, who knows? Because this, I look, they're sitting at the eighth spot, and sure, the Celtics are a gauntlet of a team. Okay, the Celtics yes. are an absolute. I mean, they've been dominating teams. I think they don't even do. They even have twenty losses this year. No, they don't even have twenty losses this year. I mean, yeah. they've been breezing by. But the we've seen the Heat come out of the play. But we've seen the Heat come out of the play, and it's Jimmy buckets. I mean, Jimmy are interesting in the playoffs. He said, he said on, you know, I, I saw a social media clip. He says he goes nuclear, and I couldn't agree more. Yeah. The dude is nuclear when it comes. And the reason why I think it works so well is you said, okay, sure, they don't have the superstar talent, but they work so well together in the and, postseason, and, and that's important. That's the point that you brought up, Jude. When you don't have a superstar, I feel like, obviously, we know for the Heat, Jimmy Butler is the top dog. Mm -hmm. But even he has a, a, a style where... People can mesh with him, mm -hmm. and you can flow together. People know their roles. Jimmy, as the best player and the scorer on this team, yeah. knows his role. I think the Heat will win. 
Heat are scary. The Heat are always Heat are scary, scary in, in the playoffs. Jeez. In the playoffs. Yep. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they honestly gave the Celtics a nice little run mm. for their money. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, we've obviously seen the Celtics team in the past, in the past few years. Jason Tatum is trying to be that guy in the playoffs, and yep. he's always fallen short. He wears mm. the number of rings he has on his jersey. He really does <laughs> with wearing number zero, you know? So I really wouldn't be surprised. And, I mean, we've seen this Heat team. They're not a regular season team. They're a playoff mm. team. Yeah. They, they, they get the job done in the regular season to get – a berth in the playoffs, and once they once they go and make the playoffs, they, they they kick it into second gear. So I wouldn't be surprised if the Heat if they end up playing the Celtics in the first round. That's a series that I I think could go up to up to six games. Honestly, I mean most people will see Celtics right haven't lost twenty games this season. They've been rolling this entire year. I think the Heat get, might win a game or two. You know, give them a little, little scare in the first round. Maybe a game or two. I don't. I don't. I think I, Celtics I, I, have I, that. I, I, I want to believe in the Heat this year. I think the Celtics will probably end up closing that series in six. But I do. I do agree. I don't think it's going to be like one of those one-eight matchups where we see like like let's say the even the Nuggets Kings is a good one-eight matchup on the West. So like yeah. I think both of these one-eight matchups they're not going to be you know. 4-0, right? Mm -hmm. They won't even be a gentleman sweep. I there see is a gentleman sweep with the Celtics. Really? Celtics Heat. I see it. See, look, I, look, look. Jason, Jason has some pressure on him this year. Mm. He's he's, he's had pressure on him every year. No, no, no. But he has, no, no, no. He has, he has pressure he's on him, but do you think he's going to live up to it? Well, well we're going to see right now if he's that guy. Yeah, we mm. know, he he, you know, he's he's a, one, he's a American, homegrown, he's a handsome guy, mm -hmm. played at Duke, he's got swagger, he's he came into the league, came into the league, dunked on Braun. Dunked on Brown, solidified himself yeah. as the next young up-and-coming guy, but he has yet to win a ring. And in America and in this league, we qualify someone's status, someone's eliteness as a player mm -hmm. yep. based on if you have a chip or not. Jason, in his, in his seventh season now for the Celtics, he's having a great season. He's averaging 23.1, I believe. This is the year, dog. You but gotta, you gotta capitalize. It's gotta it sounds like, it sounds well, like the Cowboys the all yeah, over I mean, again. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's going to be the same story over again. I think we, like you said, there is pressure on him. He's not going to show up. I, 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 I yeah. fully believe that. I think Anthony yeah. Edwards is that young star that is actually going to win a red before the I, I think the Anthony Edwards has bright. the talent. I think they have the team. But yeah, no, I, I, I think the Heat will. They're not going to handle business, but I but I think at the end of the day, Celtics might get to round two or three, but they're going to collapse. Yeah. I, Correction: I, Tatum is averaging twenty six point nine points per game. I'm sorry, but uh, as far as the bad. Heat, gentlemen sweep anyway. Yeah, wow. I don't but know. you're not wrong. I, I do. Anthony Edwards is interesting too. He's definitely. But who else do we got on these markets? Yeah. Guys? Oh my God. Well, I'm going to move yeah, over the west to side. the west side. The party's here on the west side. <laughs> okay. So yeah. tonight we got Pelicans Warriors at seven o'clock. I think okay. that'll be a good one. Warriors are obviously locked into the play-in. Pelicans are trying to avoid it. They haven't played since January 10th. The Pelicans dominated 141 to 105, and they had eight players in double figures in that game. Wow. The Warriors blew them out though late October, 130 to 102. Steph led all scorers with 42 and had five assists and five rebounds. So this one is more of a toss-up for me. Well, to be honest, I don't see it as a toss-up. You know why? Because them boys, man, mm. them Warriors. Championship they, DNA. They have that championship yep. DNA. They have that Look pedigree. Look at them. Look at that. They ah. know when to turn it on. Look yep. at that score. Well, <laughs> and it's a one. It's a one. Ga yeah. Okay. Score aside, you. It's. <laughs> I mean, they're also they're nine and one in their last ten, and you put this yep. kind of pressure on one of the best players of our generation. What do you think? He's yep. not going to show up. Oh, he's right. yeah, he's gonna I mean, show he up. shows up. They have been showing up the last two weeks. They're nine and one in their last ten. Like right. the season's on the line for them. The Pelicans I mean, are the up. ones who should be a little nervous. The they Pelicans should. Be they should. Nervous. Now, I, agree. I have a question. If you're Steph, and you're you know looking at these matchups or looking at these potential matchups. What are you fighting for? Like, what are you working well, towards? Like, I, you don't have to cement your legacy. Yeah. Like, what are you working for? I, I mean, I think at, at this point, it's just racking up wins. Yeah. I, I, I think the championships already speak to Steph Curry. Is. He has four in his bag. Like, he, yeah. he's, he's, he's proven himself. He doesn't need to do any much more. Right. And honestly, that whole Warriors team doesn't really need to do anything else. Yeah. Now, for them, it's going to be tough, right? You look at the Western Conference and who are they facing? I mean, they're probably going to be facing the Nuggets the first round if they even want to get if out. They can so get out of the that's always yeah. that's going to be the tough thing for, and, and that's why this game is so important because it's it really depends like for seeding the Pelicans with a loss here and maybe potentially a loss to the Lakers, they could see themselves drop out into the plan. And if you're the Pelicans, you don't want that, right? Yeah. You you you'd rather play a Thunder team and as great as the Thunder are, you'd yeah, rather play yeah. an inexperienced mm -hmm. Thunder team yes. than you're playing the Timberwolves. You're playing the Nuggets, and and so for the Pelicans, of course they have all the pressure on themselves mm. certainly um yeah. yeah 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 next matchup we got the uh sons and kings 
It's going down tonight. That one is. That's Sons like and a Kings, who are fighting, fighting, fighting for that last spot in there. Uh, Seven thirty tonight. So last time they got, these guys saw each other was just a few weeks ago, February thirteenth. The Suns won one thirty to one twenty-five. Fox had forty and nine, and Sabonis with thirty-five, mm. eighteen, and twelve in the loss. Mm. Ugh. the Kings struggled from three. KD, Book, Eric Gordon, each with 20-plus. And then in the other matchup this year, January 16th, the Suns won 119-117, got 33 from Fox, and another Sabonis triple-double and still couldn't pull it off. Wow. So for me, I'm looking at the Kings like, y'all can't beat them. Y'all got to show me y'all can beat this team. Mm. Y'all can't beat this team. Y'all stars are dropping crazy numbers on them, and y'all cannot beat this team. So, I'm, I mean, KD and Booker are both averaging 27.2 right now. They don't need to go absolutely crazy, apparently, to beat mm -hmm. this Kings team. So, I'm cool. I'm cool taking the Suns in this matchup every day. I, uh, I think it's interesting because I actually don't have a lot of faith in this Suns team. Oh. But, but. Not but, many of us do. To be fair, last week we predicted they would drop. It <laughs> seems that they have the Kings number. And sometimes... You just have a team's number. Yep. Right? You just you beat a team. So yeah. I could see the Suns taking this one. I mean, yeah, I, I, I agree with the Suns too. And, and I'll, I'll speak to this. I think Kevin Durant needs to show up. Oh, yeah. Kevin Durant, and I yeah. understand 27 points a game. I'm not disrespecting what he's done this season, but that's regular season basketball. I think yeah. the Suns at the end of the day are going to win this. They're going to beat the Kings. They'll be in the playoffs and they're going to face the Timberwolves. Kevin show Durant has to run. show yeah. something yeah. this postseason. Mm. You went to this. You, you went to the Brooklyn Nets. You had your opportunity to be with another super team. You didn't win a championship. Now you're kind of the main dog on this team. As good as Devin Booker has been, yeah. and he's the young gun, you are the veteran. You are the leader of that team. Kevin Durant, you've got to show up, okay? Yeah. You, you, haven't, you haven't shown anything since the Warrior days of winning championships when you needed a guy like Steph Curry. So for the Suns right now, I understand they've, they're still, they've been very good this season. They, you know, obviously, they're, they're you know, 15, 14 games above 500, whatever they are. Kevin Durant has to show up. And, and that's my biggest thing for this Suns team. Like, if, they want, if he wants to cement anything, it's, it's now. Kevin Durant's legacy is on the line. With mm -hmm. oh with, yeah, with this season, maybe the next season, his legacy is on the line. It's been how long since he's you know won a championship? And you know, what was that? Twenty seventeen. And, and, and those two championships were with you know the help of Steph Curry, who's yep. you know you can get into that debate. Who's better all the time, Kevin Durant, Steph Curry? Steph Curry proved he can win without Kevin yep. Durant. Kevin yep. Durant cannot. Do I think he's going to do anything in the playoffs though? No, he might make it into the playoffs. He might you know win that play-in game. I think he probably will. I think. <laughs> I think the Kings are honestly the better team, but the Suns, like J. Mart said, they just they have their number. Yep. The, yep. the Suns, for whatever reason, the way the matchup stands, they have it, but they're not going to do anything after that. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the NBA is going to be very exciting for night. Honestly, till the end of April, till we really get to that championship, oh, it's yeah. always a great time. We're going to have a plenty of exciting series, and of course, we'll see Jimmy Buckets. But we'll be back after this break to talk the NFL because we have an exciting event coming up in just two weeks.
And we couldn't go longer without talking about the NFL draft. Probably one of the more exciting times for all, all us football fans. and An opportunity to really see the new generation of talent come into the league and, and really unlock their childhood dreams. So it's a big deal in the NFL draft. But we'll get to the NFL draft in a second. Because right now I want to talk about some free agents that are still on the board. Some veteran names that honestly should be signed by a team. I mean, these used to be X factors for teams, even stars, franchise pieces for some teams in the f in the past. And now they're still looking for a team to, to you know take on. So with the first round of free agency over, we now kind of have the twilight players. And the first guy that I want to highlight is Odell Beckham Jr. Of course, it's got to be Odell. Odell Beckham Jr. is kind of been one of those more interesting players in the NFL, at least. You know, he, he kind of bounced around. I know he started with the New York Giants and was an absolute star, right? He, he played for the Giants from 2014 to 2018, then went to the Browns from 2019 to 2021, and then he went to the Rams in 2021. He's a one-time Super Bowl champ. He's a three-time Pro Bowler. He's a Rookie of the Year. He's amassed over 7,900 yards in his career, 59 total touchdowns, 566 receptions. And on top of that, he's had five 1,000-yard seasons. Now, last year with the Baltimore Ravens, he wasn't really the same guy, right? He only he had a limited, you know, care, he had limited catches, only 565 yards, three touchdowns. So for a guy like Odell Beckham, and I'll throw this to you, Logan. You know, you're, you're a Giants fan. You saw him in his heyday. Where could a guy like Odell Beckham land? Yeah, I mean, this guy, Odell, back in his prime, his young days, any, every single kid on the block was wearing that 13 Giants mm -hmm. jersey. <laughs> he had that impact in New York, where, where I was from. And I will say, he can have that impact wherever he goes. And clearly, at this point in his career, he's a little washed, and he's had injuries derail it a little bit. But any team that he goes to, he's going to make an impact. I mean, we saw it with the Ravens, and obviously people thought he was going to be that receiver one, that go-to guy from Lamar, and he wasn't. But he still made an impact for that Ravens team. He bolstered that offense, and whatever team he goes to, he's going to very clearly but make that But where do you want to see him? I'm wondering, I'm wondering where you want to see him. I want to see him. Reunion? I look. I think. I think if he if he went to the Giants, Giants fans would welcome in him, him in with open arms. But I think he's going to go to an, another team in the state of New York. I think he's going to go to Buffalo. Mm. I think the Buffalo Bills would be a, a good fit for Odell. And we saw they've kind of cleared house with their receiver room, right? Mm -hmm. No more Stephon Diggs. No more Gabe Davis. They don't really have that go-to guy. And I know Odell's not going to have a thousand-yard career or another one thousand-yard season like he had the pat in the past. But he's going to be a playmaker that will be Josh Allen's go-to guy. I think a good landing spot is you know, kind of similar to, to that Buffalo team. Stay in the AFC, stay with a team with an amazing quarterback, and you've also got just an amazing team around him. I think I wouldn't like to see it, but it would be interesting to see a Kansas City Chiefs <laughs> with Odell Beckham on that team. I mean, look, Odell Beckham is its this weird dichotomy of He's not, he's not the talent of the wide receiver one, but he kind of wants to be the wide receiver mm -hmm. one. You, you can't put him somewhere where he's the wide receiver one. The Chiefs take care of that. They got Rasheed Rice. He's their young guy. He's their best receiver. But you also don't want to put him at the wide receiver three because he, he doesn't he, – he, he's that guy that, you know, even though it's not good for the team, the reality is he, he will – he'll have a tantrum. He will melt down yeah. if he's the wide receiver three. Yeah. The Chiefs are that – perfect middle ground like he technically is the wide receiver three behind Kelsey and Rasheed Rice but on the depth chart he's the wide receiver two and he's still an amazing talent I, I don't know exactly how old he is I think he's like 30 years old 31 31 he's yeah. not washed mm -hmm. he's not no. in his prime he's not and washed. Mahomes will make him look good he's, like exactly. any quarterback who will launch him a nice deep ball will make him look good Mahomes I, will make Odell you know look good saying? he'll bring out the so. talent in him. but who's I mean, got the best arm talent Josh Allen well, you know who else has really good arm town, and we'll see what he does, but Aaron Rodgers. I think if you line this guy up with uh, Aaron Rodgers and Wait, the New York Jets. Odell with Aaron Rodgers? 100%. Oh, my gosh. I, I, I can't imagine. I ESPN. The <laughs> that, would, that would be that crazy. That would be horrible. Look, yeah. Yeah. OBJ needs to be in a place where he is in a big market. Okay, The Kansas City Chiefs, as much as we want to talk about, they might not even be playing in Kansas City in a couple of years with how the Dallas Mayor is talking about maybe potentially moving them to Texas. Brother, you can't pair a diva. With a guy like Aaron Rodgers, who's full of himself, it just it, it won't work. Mm. With no. the Jets, what do you I, mean? At the end of the day, they need a playmaker, and so, and so I'm just saying because of the idea of sure the locker room stuff you're gonna have to figure out, but also OBJ at his age, 31 years old, he has to understand he's not the number one guy. Like yeah. I, you were talking about it, Nolan. Like sure he wants to be it, but he has to understand at the end of the day he's older, he's had injuries, he can't be the same guy. So if he takes on a little bit more of a yeah. leadership role, Garrett Wilson's there. That's a perfect yeah. guy that he can mentor. But talking about another receiver, that's Tyler Boyd, a little bit younger on the younger side, mm -hmm. still has plenty of years ahead of him here in the NFL. What Tyler Boyd is known for is being the consistent 
playmaker on third and fourth down, right? He's He bounced around. He started with the Bengals. He was drafted in 2016. And his role kind of decreased, right? He wasn't the same guy after Jamar Chase and T. Higgins came in. He actually had 1,000 yards, the back-to-back 1,000-yard -back seasons before Jamar Chase and T. Higgins came in in 2021 and 2020. I believe Tyler Boyd could be a great player, and I believe he could be a great player for the Dallas Cowboys. Where do you guys see Tyler Boyd fitting? So, oh, I mean, to be fair, I wouldn't like to see him go somewhere like San Francisco, but I'm like, why not add a weapon like that? What's that going to hurt y'all for real? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I would like him, you know, to go to the Eagles, but the, the coaches and the playmaking would make him look horrible. So it doesn't matter. Dr. Nick, I, I, I hate to keep, you know, pushing your dreams down, but I think that I think the Niners is, is just not an amazing fit. Oh. I, I, I think he'll be good on that team, but I think the Niners, they don't need to spend their money on more weapons. Like they've already got all the weapons who I think he to do what? What have they done? I mean, they, they have they haven't at the end of the day done anything. Honestly, I don't know what the answer is. I think coaching had a lot to do with it, yeah. but I can tell you what the answer isn't. The answer isn't to go get someone behind Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, yeah. George Kittle. I think they got enough weapons. Eh. Who doesn't have enough weapons are the Pittsburgh Steelers. They've got George Steel Pickens. City. George Pickens is an amazing deep threat. He's ridiculously athletic. He's so gifted, mm. so talented. Say what you want about his, you know, everything that is going on with George Pickens, but he's an amazing wide receiver. Tyler Boyd, first of all, I think can be that kind of mentor guy. Funny enough, you know, two AFC North divisional rivals, but still mm. Boyd can be that mentor for Pickens, but also he can be that security, you know, third and five possession receiver that the Steelers need. Now, the Steelers also have the issue of quarterback play. Yeah. We'll see what happens this year. It sounds like there's a little bit of an improvement, but at the wide receiver position, George Pickens is that guy that you just watch and are like, how, how can he make that catch? Tyler Boyd isn't that guy, but he's that guy that can get you out of some trouble. Yeah, and, and, and to piggyback off you, I think he would be a great supplement to George Pickens. And, and very, it's very clear that this Steelers team, they moved on from Deontay Johnson. He was their go-to guy. Now it's on George Pickens, and he has that incredible playmaking ability. You throw him a jump ball, he's going to make that catch. But if you need a guy for third and five, who's going to be who, who's going to be that go-to guy? I think yeah. Tyler Boyd would fill, fit that void. And I think him going to a team like the Steelers, the Steelers have seen him a lot playing against him in division. They've seen they, they play the Bengals twice a year. I would not be surprised if the Steelers and Mike Tomlin made mm. a move like this to get a guy like Tyler Boyd a consistent asset to their offense. So you I guys agree. Team. Hmm. No one has mentioned. I'm surprised, Logan, that you yourself haven't mentioned. What about the Lions? What about the Lions? I mean, you look at this team, they obviously have, they have their them? wide receiver one with Amon Ross St. Brown. He's a reliable, good guy. They need a wide receiver too. They need a guy who can instill some consistency, who can make the big catches on the third downs, like you said. Dan Campbell's got this team rolling. You need Tyler. Tyler could use the confidence that Dan instills into his players, and like you said, a good quarterback like a golf can make Boyd look even better. I'm so sorry to say well, this a better to you. that was the only chance the Lions had. <laughs> I'm so sorry to say that to you. That was the only chance. They had. I don't know. What? I, I, that I was mean, the I, only I, chance. I, I, I beg Wait, to differ. What? I think, that was the only chance. I think this Lions team, the culture that Dan Campbell That's has what made. I'm saying. I think for as long as Dan Campbell is there, I think this Lions team will compete. They're relevant. And, They're and relevant. I agree. I think the, okay. the Lions look at the end of the day. Is Jared Goff the guy that can fully win you a Super Bowl? Do you believe Jared Goff can be the guy that win you fully a Super Bowl? Because I, I do think you have the talent. I think you have the roster around him. And I think in a perfect storm, this Lions team could win a Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. I don't think it, they might even win a Super Bowl before the Dallas Cowboys. This was and that, their that's, shot. that's personally where I, I think agree. they'll have another chance. This and was their shot. The 30 yeah. TDs, I mean, 12 interceptions. Come I on. mean, the, the, another reason why I think the Lions are going to stay relevant is because what Brad Holmes has done mm -hmm. with the Lions, with their draft, with their free agency signings, mm -hmm. he has kept them relevant. And I mean, we saw their free agent, or, excuse me, their rookie class this past year, Sam Laporta, Jameer Gibbs, two of their three best offensive playmakers, offensive weapons this past year, came from the draft class that they had. Mm -hmm. They're only going to keep getting better with more experience. Brad Holmes keeps hitting with all of his yeah. draft picks. I wouldn't be surprised mm -hmm. if the Lions, you know, bolster their corner, their, their secondary with some cornerbacks, some safeties in the draft, and they go from being the team that led up the most passing yards in the NFL to being a top 15, 10, 15 yeah. defense this mm -hmm. year. Well, so and, would and, you like to see Tyler Boyd on that team? Would he be a good mm -hmm. fit? So is that a need? I think, I think the Lions can, and I think they're going to spend money elsewhere. Yeah. I think there are clear, there's very, like we saw, the Lions, they made a great run, and they almost made it to the Super Bowl, but they had some holes. It was in the secondary, and their offensive line was a little thin towards the end of the season. Yeah. They have a great offensive line, but when they're injured, that's where it, it kind of goes, goes to rubble. So I will say, I think Tyler Boyd could be a good fit, and I think they were missing that wide receiver too last season. Mm -hmm. Josh Reynolds yeah. did not get it done, and if he made a few catches in the, in, in the 
NFC Championship, Ooh. the Lions could be playing the Super Bowl, right? Exactly. So if they had that wide receiver too, it would have made a, a big impact. But I think the Lions are going to go yeah. spend their money elsewhere, spend it on a good secondary. I think a guy like Micah Hyde, Justin Simmons, mm -hmm. even Stephon Gilmore, you take a flyer and a veteran to bolster the secondary, teach the young guys how it's done. I think that's what the Lions are going to do. Yeah, and actually talking about Micah Hyde, he's another free agent that's li let's dive into real quick because he's 33 years old. He's a little bit on the older side for, you know, a safety at this point. But he's been consistent as it has ever been. With the Green Bay Backers, is that where he started his career in 2013 to 2016. He has 24 career interceptions, 644 career tackles, one-time Pro Bowler. And here's a good note. 13 playoff games he started and he's a leader of a team i think that's a very important thing you can see him hyping up his team right here this is a safety that you can bring into a young team i think the lions could be a really good uh, addition for him where he can really mentor that secondary they kind of need it right there's younger pieces on that outside especially in the secondary and just being the guy that can fill the void and he's made big plays i mean it, it, this pick six against patrick Mahomes right here is is the the plays that he can make he's been in big situations like i said 13 playoff games another team i want to keep the eye on and is the atlanta falcons jesse Bates had a really good year for the Atlanta Falcons last year. He was kind of the best player outside of Grady Jarrett for that Falcons team. And you pair him with Micah Hyde and experienced safety. I think this Falcons team, and I'm going to say it right now on air, I think this Falcons team could be a not a serious contender, but I think they're going to contend in the NFC next year. Any other <laughs> teams where you Maybe can see their division potentially, Jude? Any for other sure. teams Any that, other. I, NFC can, South, anyway. that I could see oh, I Micah Hyde go you to? Can. I, can. I would say the Cleveland Browns. I would say the Cleveland Browns are another team that could use the safety. That's where, honestly, mm -hmm. the Cleveland Browns have struggled a lot last year, right? Their front seven is loaded. They got Miles Garrett, obviously, JOK is really coming to his role. They have plenty of depth on that front seven, but the secondary is really where the Cleveland Browns struggled last year. Mm -hmm. Grant Delpit has been one of their guys in the mm -hmm. secondary that really hasn't shined at times. And, and Denzel Ward's the only big playmaker on that on the Cleveland Browns secondary. So I think bringing a guy like Micah Hyde, he's experienced. And like I said i think the 13 playoff games started is notable he's been in big moments and, and the browns they're going to be in big moments next year so they're going to need a player like him you talk about experience you talk about being in big moments of course you know i had to go here <laughs> zeke yeah ezekiel elliott mm. former dallas cowboy mm. i know you're very familiar with his game mm. oh, i'm very he's familiar. on this list how do you feel about him what, what are your thoughts takeaways well, Zeke means everything to me. I mean, I'll, I'll say that. From watching him as a kid, you know, he was drafted in 2016 to the Dallas Cowboys and somehow still played in the NFL last year on another team, which is even crazy to me that he was on the Patriots last year. But look, he's a three-time Pro Bowler, one-time All-Pro. He has over 8,900 rushing yards with 71 mm. touchdowns. But here's the thing to note for Ezekiel Elliott, and this is why I don't see Ezekiel Elliott having a place in the NFL anymore. Mm -hmm. 2,000 rushing attempts over mm. his career. Wow. He has Usage, a lot man. of yep. mileage on him. And I think he's been injured too, right? He's had his knee yeah. injuries. I love Ezekiel Elliott, right? I think he's 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 a great person. He's He did great stuff for the community in Dallas and in Foxborough as well. But he just doesn't have that breakaway speed that he used to mm -hmm. with the Dallas Cowboys. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm talking his rookie year. He was explosive, man. There was a game against the Cincinnati Bengals where he ran for 50 yards and didn't even get touched. Ran for 50 yards yeah. and didn't even get touched and scored a touchdown. You, we don't see that with Ezekiel yep. Elliott anymore. And, yep. that, and that's the shame. So for me, Ezekiel Elliott, he, he should be out of the league. It's, it's, it's over for him. And it's sad because he's only 28 years old. What do you guys think over there? Jude, it's not just over. It's been oh. over for Ezekiel <laughs> Elliott for a, about five years. Ever since 2019, I mean, we've, we've mm -hmm. seen it year after year. Tony Pollard has been the best running back yeah. on that team for, for a long time. It wasn't just, you know, last season when he finally got the whole backfield to himself. Ezekiel Elliott has not averaged over 4.2 yards a carry since 2019. Sheesh. He has not been a good running back for a long time. And, you know, Jude, you were saying he has all that wear and tear. I'm not denying that. I mean, it's, it's, not, his, it's not his fault that he hasn't been no. good in five years. But he just hasn't. It, he, has, he hasn't been. I'm okay. not blaming it on him. But I have a question. Is there any value? Like, my dad used to say this about this one running back. You ask him for two yards, he'll give you two. You ask yeah. him for three yards, he'll That's give you two. Right? <laughs> That's what so, he can do. Exactly. Can Is there any yards. value to having a guy maybe in the red zone that you know can just punch it in if you need there, it? Like for any there, team? There, there, there definitely is. And I, and I think that's what makes Ezekiel Elliott special. And, and his ability and the reason, and when he came into his league, I think the thing that people love so much, scouts love so much, I personally love so much when I watch his game, is he never stopped the legs, right? He mm -hmm. always kept moving even after he got hit. Yards after contact was out of the you know out of the roof yeah. like he could just continue to he'd pick up five yards after getting tackled that was the type of physical runner that you saw with Ezekiel Elliott 
But talking about the young rookie that Ezekiel Elliott was in 2016, we have some young rookies coming up this year in the NFL draft and an exciting time to see what we can talk about. So the NFL mock draft for TLT is now coming to you right here for the first time ever. We're going to see what the months and months of, you know, our draft scouts have been able to create. So we'll put it on the board for you right here for you to see and our mock draft. So obviously with the first overall pick, there's no question who it is, guys. Our very own, it's USC's very own, Caleb Williams. He's Fight going on. to the Bears. The Bears would be insane if they Needs didn't take him. no other introduction. Now you can see Roma Dunes at four. That is a questionable pick, okay? I personally didn't pick that. You know, we have 10 scouts, so someone's got to make the decision at the day. I didn't pick that. Roma Dunze is not a top five pick. That is absurd. We'll talk top about 10, that. Top 10. He's top, top 10, 10 for sure. And I really like, if a Roma Dunze falls to nine to the Chicago Bears is where I really love it. He pairs with Caleb Williams. I know Alafant, uh, Fa Fashnuo, the O tackle for Penn State, he's fantastic. And he's a former teammate of Caleb Williams. They both played at high school at Gonzaga in Washington, D.C. Would be a great pairing. But at the end of the day, I would love to get, see them get a receiver at nine. Now, Brock Powers at 10. That's where I think the big steal is for the New York Jets. If the New York Jets got to mm. get a guy like Brock Bowers, that is a key piece to that offense that they can add, right? They have Garrett Wilson on the outside. Hell, maybe they had OBJ like we were talking about earlier, okay? <laughs> but if you add a guy like Brock Bowers, he could be a good pass blocker, he can run block, and then he also can catch. I mean, this man could catch anything coming his way. I personally think he's a top five pick. If he falls to 10, he's a steal. Moving on to more into this mock draft. I was going to say, it looks like we're missing a couple was, names. Was, this was, should I be out there. We, we are missing some names, and that's Jaden Daniels. That at was 12. the name. At, 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 at 11 with the Minnesota Vikings. At 11, now, so so you want to keep in mind there was no trades in this mock draft. So the Vikings are definitely one of those potential teams that are going to trade up. Whether they like Daniels and he falls to five or hell, maybe they'll go to five and get McCarthy. We don't know. But at the end of the day, Jaden Daniels at 11 is interesting. The Vikings fill their hole with quarterbacks. So I think that's why it could be another steal for the Vikings right there. Looking more into this draft, I think another interesting note is Michael Penix at 13. I'm, Ooh, I'm high on Michael Penix. I think this is a perfect spot for Michael Penix to go. I know it seems very high and the injuries aside, and but the Las Vegas Raiders need a quarterback. You know why this is the perfect spot for him? It's warm in Vegas. Mm. <laughs> it's warm in Vegas. He's had two ACL injuries. You don't put a guy like that in a cold weather town. Mm. I like the Las Vegas Raiders for Michael Penix Jr. Well, like they do that. play in a dome, so I don't think they have to worry too much about the weather. No, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not about playing. It's about yeah. lifestyle. It's mm. about being in a, mm -hmm. in a warm city Talk versus a cold city. Yeah. This is a real thing. No, that's true. And, and I'll, also, I'll, one more name here in the you know, one, 11 through 20, Byron Murphy to the Seattle Seahawks. I think the Seattle Seahawks are kind of one of these up-and-coming teams. They have the talent on offense, their defense. They got Devon Witherspoon last year with the fifth overall pick. You know, I thought personally, I was like, Devon Witherspoon at the fifth overall pick was a reach for them. Turned out to be a fantastic rookie. They got Tyreek Woolen on the other side. They need the interior guy. That's what Byron Murphy does. He's not the biggest guy, but he's extremely he's fast. He's explosive. Great lateral he, movement. He can attack the A and B gaps very smoothly. I think the Seattle Seahawks will strive if they can get Byron, move, Byron Murphy at 16. But moving on to kind of the end all of the final of the first round. And you see some interesting names here, okay? Kool-Aid. Who picked JJ McCarthy to the Dallas Cowboys? Okay. <laughs> I, and I, and I'll, I'll do a little Just note right here. Hey, hey, I'll do a little bit of a note right here, right? We're in our draft meeting yesterday, and Felipe looked me dead in the eyes and picked that man, JJ McCarthy. <laughs> okay. If I'm the Dallas Cowboys, I'm not picking JJ McCarthy. I'm staying very far away from You don't from believe in them. It, well, first, I don't believe in J.J. McCarthy. That is a fact, okay? I don't believe in J.J. McCarthy. I've said it. I've been very adamant about it since January. The second thing is the Cowboys, let's get over this. They don't need a quarterback. I understand that Dak mm. Prescott might not be here next year, but we can <laughs> figure that out when the prom comes. We need to figure out this offensive line. The offensive line is where, where we have troubles. So I think we take a center with that position. And then at the end, I think the Buffalo Bills, get they get Trey for That's the big question. Drake May or Jaden Daniels? What do you guys have? You got to take Jaden Daniels. He is NFL ready right now. I know there are concerns about mm. his frame, his build at LSU. But this young brother can play. Mm. Straight mm. up. Mm. He can play. Mm -hmm. He can play the game of football. He ran for 10 touchdowns. I believe he had 40 on the season. He was a slinger. He had great games. Mm. You got to take him. He's tall. He can mm. see over the line. He's going to get in the weight room. He's going to become an even better thrower and a better quarterback mm -hmm. as he is in the league. Mm -hmm. you got to take him. What about to you two on the couch real quick? Yeah, I think the commanders, it's obvious that they want to find their quarterback of the future. They've been going through the quarterback carousel for four or five years now, and they have not found their guy. Obviously, they want to get their guy in the draft this season, 
But Drake May is not going to make that immediate impact that Jaden Daniels is. Yep. We saw last season he threw for over 4,000 yards, rushed for over 1,000 yards. That game is going to translate into the NFL right away. A quarterback like Drake May, you're taking a flyer on. He's not, gonna, he's not NFL ready right now. Will he be NFL ready in three to five years? Sure. Will he be a good quarterback in three to five years? Sure. But you, if you want a guy who can make an impact right now, you want Jaden Daniels. And that's who I think the commander should take. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think Jaden Daniels is the most NFL ready other than maybe Caleb Williams mm -hmm. in this draft. But just to play a little devil's advocate here, I mean, Drake may probably has the most arm yeah. talent other than Caleb Williams in this draft. I think if you want to talk about a pure passer, it's really hard to find someone better than Drake May. You yeah. give him a couple years, and you know, that's the point. You're investing several years into this yeah. guy. You don't know if he's going to yeah. turn out. It's risky for sure, but if he pans out, I mean, this is a guy that has talent like no. that, that really no one else has. Yeah, I, I, I think it's undeniable to see the talent in both of them. I think Jaden Daniels just with the Heisman, I think you got to give it to him. I you mean, it, it, what he did on the ground and what he did in the passing game. But that's been it for here, talking about the NFL draft and, and everything that's upcoming. I mean, we will be having a draft show here on Talk of Troy to break down the actual day of the NFL draft. But that's been it here. We'll see you on this in a second when we talk a little bit more craziness in the sports world. <laughs> Hey, Twitter world, this is yours truly. Hello, Twitter world, this is me, yours truly. Hey, Twitter world, it's me, yours truly. The presumed uh, vehicle of O.J. Simpson is still traveling very slowly northbound along the 5 freeway, uh, coming up again towards the 91 intersection. At that point, we'll just have to wait and see which way he's going to go. But uh... Football phenom, celebrity mogul and icon, O.J. Simpson has passed yesterday at the age of... 76 after battling prostate cancer. I produced a package for Annenberg Media TV yesterday detailing with his life. We now turn to a story a lot of people are talking about today. OJ Simpson has died after battling prostate cancer. The former star athlete was acquitted for killing his ex-wife Nicole Brown Simpson but spent nine years in prison for kidnapping and armed robbery. OJ Simpson was an American success story also known as Juice on the field. At USC, he broke rushing records and won the Heisman Trophy in 1968. In his 22 game career here as a Trojan, he ran for over 3,000 yards and 36 touchdowns. He won a national title and two Pac-8 crowns. Simpson was the first overall pick in 1969 and had an 11 year career in the NFL. In 1985, he was inducted into the Hall of Fame. 
Life after football was bright and included movies, commercials, sports analysis, wealth, and marriage. It took the nation by surprise when he was accused of the double murder of his ex-wife and her friend. The nation was glued to the televised trial, which lasted nine months. Simpson lawyers, known as the Dream Team, was led by Johnny Cochran. The team challenged the reliability of the police evidence and the prosecution. The trial reached its climax when Cochran said, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. The Ford Bronco chase was one of the first live police pursuits ever televised. The nearly two hour chase on the 405 freeway was watched by 95 million people. OJ Simpson died in Las Vegas. He was 76 years old. Well, OJ Simpson certainly had one hell of a career. Uh, I mean, it, on, on and off the field. I mean, th there's no two ways to put it. I mean, yeah. we're talking about a football legend, a Heisman Trophy winner, an MVP in the NFL. Yeah. You know, dominated the league when he was there. I mean, he was shifting dudes left and right. They needed a map to find him. Oh, I mean, yeah. that, that, that was the thing with him, off the, with him on the field. Then off the field, obviously, that's where the issues came. What is some of your guys' as crazy it is favorite moment of OJ? There was an interview he did with a reporter where he was like pretending to be, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Like they were doing a skit or whatever, and then he do, was like pretending to be stabbing her. And I was like, it wasn't a skit, it was a prank. It was a prank. She didn't know it was gonna happen. She did it not was know. a prank. But in that know. moment when I looked in his eyes, I said, he did it. He did it. <laughs> <laughs> No. Yeah. He did. And he got away with it. He got away with it. You know what I'm saying? OJ said to me that uh, he had a surprise for me, and I genuinely was surprised. Just did you do it? <laughs> uh, no, I didn't. I think it was his idea of a joke. Nope. And this is it. The, the man was a true. Uh, uh, he was funny. <laughs> uh, he, he was certainly funny. Yeah, I mean, after something like that, I mean, even the form that he has, I mean, it's 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 to perfection. So I, I think he definitely did it. But I think another great clip is uh, Dave Chappelle talking mm. about OJ Simpson. Yeah. We'll run the clip right here in, in his stand. How could you? She said. How could you shake hands with that murderer? I said, Jim, with all due respect. That murderer ran for over 11,000 yards. <laughs> and he was acquitted. So, you know, fuck it. And he was acquitted. Uh, yeah. So that, that's, that's all we have on OJ Simpson. But I'll throw it over to Logan. Uh, talk about EPEC. So recently, this morning, we had a development with Dodgers former translator Ipe Mizuhara. And this man was cooking in the lab of the sports books. This guy pleaded guilty to stealing money to theft and towards gambling, where he amassed over $40 million in losses. This guy placed over 19,000 wagers over 26 months. 19,000? 19, to do the math for you, that is 24 bets per day. <gasps> hey, he was working. And on average, what? for each bet that he placed, he lost $2,000. And, and that's the thing, oh my he gosh. wasn't working. Because oh, the dude wait. was losing money. I, I, I What's saw the opposite his, of cooking? His total losses were $180 million. Wow. Mm -hmm. How does Shohei not know? I think that's that's the bigger question. Like, I understand that this dude might have been an absolute genius, right? There is, and this is a report. I'm not saying that this is true, and this has been clarified. But they somehow he went into Shohei's bank account and basically turned off the notifications that they, you know, he was taking and putting money out. My thing is, sixteen million dollars. We're not noticing sixteen million dollars out of your bank account. I don't care how much money Show is making. He's making seven hundred million dollars, two million, whatever it is at this moment. Mm. Sixteen million dollars. So what are you saying, Jude? Just, just don't beat around the bush. Shohei knows. Now well, I don't think Shohei bet, but I, but I, but I, but I fully believe that there he is not telling the full truth. I think, I, he I bet. think Shohei had to know at some. I point. definitely think he bet. You how could, how could he not? I don't like, know. That's, I mean, that's I, how you manage a gambling problem is have them give you your money over 10 years. <laughs> like, seriously. I mean, yeah, I, I, I think I think it's clear that there was some betting, obviously. And I think it was all from iPay. I don't necessarily think it was from Shohei himself because the bets that, that were all placed, none of them were placed on, an, on any Major League Baseball mm -hmm. games. Mm -hmm. None of them were placed on any baseball games in general. It was all football, basketball, granted, college football professional football like AFL CFL it is all the different leagues all overseas but there's no baseball that was mm -hmm. bet and if you look at Shohei Shohei's a simple man 
this guy only knows baseball and he knows a little bit of basketball yeah. from his wife. That's yeah. it. I don't think he's out there placing bets, placing wagers, mm. especially when he knows that, uh, how much of a star he is, how much of a phenom he is. And when people bet, you try to bet for, for money purposes, yeah. right? Shohei doesn't need money, man. That's what man. I'm saying. Yeah. This guy's got a bag already. When you have a problem, already. you don't care. Like, That's when you true, have though. a problem, you would bet on little kids, Look like, racing MJ. around. Like, Look you would. With the, with the quarter game Seriously. Or he had a problem. You, you would bet Shohei on games that, that you don't even understand if you had the money to and you had a, a problem. I, I mean, Ipe didn't need money either. At that point, after how much money he stole, he didn't need money either. I no. mean, you talk about Shohei, what is it, 700 million, Ipe, how many million was it that he stole? Uh, 16, 16 million. Like 2,000 like, dollars Yeah, that's a, a huge difference. Yeah. At the end of the day, in practicality, it's all the same thing. 16 yeah. million, you can't spend that in a lifetime. Yeah. No, I, 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 I think that's, that's we're going to find out pretty soon. But, I mean, here's the thing. Like, the reason, if, if this is all going to Shohei's plan, then I got to salute Ipe because mm. he is the ultimate fall guy. I mean, oh, this yeah. dude is going to prison for his brother if that's the case. I mean, that that's insane. I mean, he's he's pleading guilty to these charges. He'll probably spend a good portion. Uh, not a good portion, but he's going to spend some years behind bars. Mm. Well, th- those going to be some comfortable years, I'll say that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I will say this one last note. <clears throat> there was text messages between Ipe <laughs> and the bookkeeper. Uh-oh. And one of them, and I, I, I want to I wanna s- quote it, from Epi, he texted saying, "I'm terrible at this sports betting thing, huh? <laughs> LOL. Any chance you could bump me again? As you know, you don't have to worry about me not paying." <gasps> and so, yeah, yeah, that's so, damning. Oh yeah, I mean that's yeah, completely damning, and, and it just it it sh- it sucks for a guy like Shohei, who this guy has clearly been in his corner since he came to the Angels in 2018, mm. and this whole time he was going behind his back you got I, I mean i know this is like obviously a, a tough story that he's losing a lot of money but you almost feel like the relationship that he built with yeah. a guy like ipe mm. to completely have that turned on your back and, and severed now. yeah and yeah. it was yeah. the first guy he came to america with you know mm-hmm. obviously ipe wasn't with him in japan but he came over it was his first real like homie that he met and now it's just gone and so you got to feel like there is that broken piece of Shohei right now just like okay sure the money's one thing but money can't replace a friendship and so I know for him it must be really tough Uh, but moving on I know can I before we move on can I just note I'm I know we do sports and culture here and Jonathan I really really appreciated your dive into OJ but I feel like because we're in LA we have to talk more about like how OJ impacted our culture here and we talked a little bit about the car chase but like the historical context of that like this murder happened in 1994 and he was acquitted in 95. LA was racial yeah. turmoil in this era. Like 1991 is Rodney, Rodney King, King getting Beatties. murdered. 1991 is Latasha Harlins getting murdered. A little girl getting murdered by a, a shop owner. Like, and, and the shop owner getting, you know, like found guilty, but having no consequences. You know, like this, this serious like dehumanization and criminalization of black people in the city that is the largest police city in the world there was there was so much tension during that time i'm happy you went back to that oh, dr yeah. nikki a lot of tension during that time it was like when rodney king was beat and then those four the four white police officers were acquitted like that just completely black people lost complete faith in the police system yes. and then when it went the other way right with oj a celebrity but a black man yeah being acquitted of murdering a white or german woman yeah it went the other way too so it was so tense at that time that's why it's so complicated yeah so nobody really does anybody really care whether he did it or not it's like was he guilty or not you know what i'm saying i don't know i don't know but my bad i just felt like we're in la we got to learn about la do the sports and culture thing tangential thing let's get it back man right real quick i really hope though that oj right before he passed took a video and just said whether or not he actually did it. Yeah. Whether he's like, <laughs> honestly, honestly, hey guys, hey, hey, he I'm coming to y'all that, saying that, I did it or I didn't do it. Whatever it is, I really hope he did yeah, that because at the end of the day, he's the only one who knows. He's yes. the only one who knows. So, well, in the words of OJ himself, what did he say? He said, I'm not black. I'm, I'm OJ. OJ. <laughs> Come on, man. So, yeah, so, but look, moving on from OJ and, and what he was as a player and, and off the field. Let's dive into the Masters. The the Let's Masters are coming up this this actually they have started this weekend and actually one name that you guys should keep track of is Tiger Woods. He just made his 24th cut into the Masters, which is a historic record, hey. I believe. A world, um, record, yeah. a world record out of any single golfer. But the Masters is a classic. It's 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 played at Augusta National Park. It's it's kind of where all the go- golf fish aficionados come together for a day of restful 
ch like cheering of games. It's not as crazy as the waste management. And that is what you have on the mm. other hand of the golf situation yep. right now. There are two different types of golf tournaments that are being put on the field. For those that aren't aware, the waste management is still a golf tournament, as I stand corrected. Um, it is, yeah. But at the end of the day, it's there for the boozing and the fun, right? It's, it's, it's different than what the master stands for. So let me first ask you guys, maybe sure you don't tune into these games, but which one do you prefer, the waste management or the masters? Off bat, I'd, uh, I'd do the masters, me personally. I know I'm young and people expect young people to all just buy into that group think mindset of we're going to run, go crazy, booze up. Nah, dude, I don't do that. I barely go to the 9-0. You can get, you, you're not going to catch me at the 9-0, matter of fact. <laughs> I like the the calm blissfulness of you know you can still drink and have fun at the golf mm -hmm. at the golf course at the tournaments but you don't need to be dressed up you know as one of the founding fathers looking crazy yeah that's just me personally. Down the hill. what about you guys on the couch yeah i think for me it's the tradition of the masters mm. i think as a casual golf fan when you see the waste management you're like that is so cool that's so sick this is what golf is all about mm. the traditional golf fan sees the waste management as this is horrible for the game of golf and this is a disgrace to the game mm -hmm. the masters is the epitome of golf right there it is the prize it is the gold of golf when you get there you're not allowed to have any phones i'm not sure if you watch yeah. the masters there's not a single phone in sight because you are physically not allowed entrance into the masters tournament with a phone that is what the masters is it's tradition it's being there experiencing the, the sounds of the golf ball, the sounds of the swings, the birds chirping, that's what it's all about. The waste management just takes all of that tradition and all of that you know tradition that they built up and just takes it all away. I mean, I can count on two hands the number of hours of golf, professional golf that I've watched. So the yeah, Masters by sure. no means is nostalgic to me. Mm -hmm. That said, there are names that I've heard. You know, seeing and watching people that I know exist, even though I've never watched them and never really cared, seeing really big name golfers is something that's really cool and to me i'm not a huge fan of golf but knowing that i'm in the presence of like one of the best athletes at, of his sport is just something special that you don't really get to do mm. every day so going to the masters yeah i'm not gonna lie i might get bored after a few hours but it'd be it'd be fun for a little bit oh i'll be the different one i'll bite the bullet and go waste management i like it i think golf is like an inaccessible sport to a lot of people i think a lot of people are not interested in getting into it i think it's difficult for a lot of people to get into playing because of different barriers to the game yeah absolutely so i think like the the tradition of the masters sort of upholds that sort of classist thing that i'm like oh uh, maybe the people can have golf you know, and it is going to be sillier and it is going to be less professional because it's the people. Yeah. But like, at least then the people have it. And that's, I think, some of the issues, I mean, I, we've been talking yeah. about is like, how do you get people interested and, in and golf who don't have yeah. that foundation of nostalgia and who know the tradition? Because mm -hmm. I don't know the tradition. Yeah. And, I, and I love that you bring that up because I think for me, it's a tough decision because I look at it as like, I think... All of you, all your points on the Masters is correct, and yeah. I feel the same exact way. It's tradition, and I and I still think to me it's the better of the two. But I think golf needs the waste management. Yeah. I think they need tournaments like For that sure. because at the end you're rolling your <sighs> eyes. But are you watching golf? Hell no. Exactly. <laughs> but guess what? A bunch of drunk people running around isn't going to make me watch it either, anymore. And sure, it won't. But for other people, they can find that as entertainment. Yeah. So they can go to the golf event yeah. and also have fun at the same time. Like, or at least let's more be, relatable more than relatable. somebody in a polo more, in the exactly. shorts but I think or whatever. Just making yeah. a joke out of the sport. And for me, I've made a bunch of jokes of the sport. I've talked about the sport as just... But, N not even really a sport, but mm. saying that something can only be enjoyable if there's just a bunch of drunk people all enclosed in, in one area, like, I can see why a avid golf fan would not appreciate that. But I yeah. think on the other side, can we only enjoy it if it's refined? No, I mean, I, I, I think that there's two, two ends of the spectrum, yeah. obviously, and, and you need to play into both sides a little bit. And, like, even so, I like the Masters, they still sell beers right and the beers are actually pretty cheap it's like six dollars for a beer right you go to a you go to a regular golf event a stadium that's 12 to 18 dollars yeah. so okay. they still have that integrity and that tradition and you'll still see people drunk at the masters they're just not <laughs> like, they're just not like you they're know not really not really not yeah. 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 you know so it's just one of those things where I think, yes, it's good in doses, and at any golf tournament, you'll see the drunk fans, the fans that are a little bit crazier, and you need that, right? Because it, it up, ups the atmosphere. But at the same time, the masters, the integrity, the tradition of it all, I think that they need more more events like the masters mm. for so the game of golf. Okay, yeah, I, I think, mean, I think like, like, like we said, 
I mean, the Masters is one of a kind and nothing is going to be like it, right? No other event is going to make you not walk in with a cell phone. You're allowed to take a cell phone to any event, for example. And prices for everything, you know, snacks and beers are going to be overly expensive. But I think the Masters is unique in that sense. And I think they need more tradition in the game of golf Mm -hmm. to get more fans. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that if you keep the tradition, you're still going to get the fans. But they've been trying that and the fans haven't been there. So is there an opportunity for... I think think it starts with the families. You know, I think for me, golf, right, goes from, goes back to when I was a kid, when my dad would take me to golf events, the the Baltistral PGA event was the one in New Jersey near my hometown that my dad took my brother and I and my little sister to. We saw the practice rounds. We're there close to the players. I think that is where you gain your yeah. clientele. It's through the traditions with the families, yeah. right? Yep. It, it starts with the family. Building it's, memories. It starts with the dad taking the kids to to go watch the Masters. Or maybe not the Masters, but you know, it starts off by taking them to go watch a PGA Championship yeah. or a PGA Tour yeah. event. And then when the kid gets older, right? Like I. In, in my future, I want to take my dad to the Masters as like a thank you of like an introduction Aww. of getting me into golf, right? So I, I think it's one of those things where it comes full circle, and I think that's the only way you're going to appeal to a certain clientele and the clientele that golf already is, right? It's already a pretty prestigious and like a pristine sport, right? It's not for everyone. So I think that you need to maintain that and build it off of the families that you've already created and create it as an experience. And, and, and talking about legacy and, and the things that are coming up, the UFC has is in a very exciting time. It's actually hitting its 300th card here this Saturday with plenty of noble fighters to be talking about. Oh, yes. And our very own, our very own skillful, knows-it-all ball knowledge, mm-hmm. uh, UFC knowledge. John the what do you have for us on, on this event? Look, brother, you said it best. UFC 300 is the biggest card of the year, and it is set to take place Saturday at T-Mobile Arena in Paradise, Nevada. The prelims will begin at 3 p.m. Pacific time. The main card begins at 7 p.m. Fans, listen, listen, this is urgent. Please, please have everything that you need because once this fight starts, you're not going to want to miss it. You're not going to leave your seat and miss any of the chaos. And when asked at the press conference about raising fight bonuses, UFC president Dana White said $300,000. It's done. Big, Big bonuses for big fights. This is what it's about. Fighters finally getting paid right and we're gonna jump straight into you know who Alex Pereira Poatan he is a 6'4 Brazilian beast he has a striking accuracy of 62% and his best weapon is right here that left hook Mm. it's that's nasty it sends people to the shadow realm he is now making his first lightweight title defense at at 205 against Jamal Hill who was the former champ so this is a big fight for the big test a lot of people were wondering, okay, how is he going to fare in this new weight class with bigger guys? He's been knocking out everybody who's put in front of him, and he's been handling business. Next up, of course, one of my personal favorite fighters, Charles Oliveira, will come up on the screen in a second. He is a lightweight known for being a submission artist. This guy is like a snake on people's backs. He has the most submission wins in UFC history with 16. But above his fighting style, what I love most about him is he is a man of the people. His nickname is Charles du Bronx. He hails from the favelas of Brazil. And people know him, he gives back to his community, and he is the real champ. As he always likes to say after he wins, the champ has a name. The champ is Charles Oliveira. And the final fight, or one of the final fights I'll be talking about is the BMF belt, the baddest motherfucker belt. Yep, the UFC <laughs> has a belt like that. And we're gonna have Justin Gaethje, the human highlight reel. This man has 20 knockouts to his name. He is on fire in the lightweight division against a former champion, Max Holloway. And it's what UFC is about. Blood, violence, sweat, sport, chaos. These are two guys who the fans love. These are two guys who are known for putting on great fights. Max Holloway has the most significant strike damage in UFC history. Guys, we are going to get a special treat. This is great. UFC 300. Thank you so much. Well, j we need to get you a baddest motherfucker belt because you absolutely knocked out those <laughs> analysis right there with the UFC. But that has been here for Studio C here for Talk of Troy. It's been a great one, and we appreciate you for spending your Friday afternoon with us. We'll see you around the corner on Monday.